Hello and welcome. I hope you're all well and staying safe. And thank you very much for joining us today. This is a special webinar in partnership with the Institution of Environmental Sciences, or the IES. Uh, and this webinar is focused on the value of Chartered Environmentalist, or CM registration. To bring this to life a little bit, we're going to be hearing from and chatting to three uh, environmental professionals who hold CM registration. If you have any questions following this webinar, feel free to contact uh, even myself or uh, actually the details should have changed on that slide and it's actually Sarah, my colleague. Um, but if you contact me, I should be able to uh, uh, answer those queries. Rihanna uh, can't join us today. Um, but she'll be able to help if you have any IES questions. As a way of an introduction to the Society for the Environment, we hold the three professional registers for environmental professionals. These are the Chartered Environmentalist, or CM, the Registered Environmental Practitioner, Practitioner or RFP, and the Registered Environmental Technician, or RF Tech. But today we are focus focusing on the CM register specifically. To add to that, the Society operates as an umbrella organisation currently made up of 24 professional bodies known as our member bodies. All of these professional bodies hold a licence granted by the Society to award the CM registration to their members. And the IES are highlighted on there as well. To achieve environmental chartership, you need to be a member of and apply via one of these 24 professional bodies. That's, if you like, one of the, the very first step to becoming a uh, chartered environmentalist along the registration process. If you want to find out more, please visit uh, socm.org.uk or inquire with one of the relevant professional bodies directly. As mentioned, this webinar is in partnership with the Institution of Environmental Sciences. Uh, the IAES offer all three environmental registrations to their appropriately experienced and knowledgeable members, uh, clearly including CM registration. One thing that the IAES offer, which may grab your attention, is the uh, CM in a day workshops, which are a fantastic way of focusing your minds and uh, completing your CM registration within a, a focused time frame uh, with support on hand from assessors throughout. There is a maximum of five candidates on each workshop, so the support is tailored really to help you get the most out of that time. Um, and you will submit your application and complete your interview during the workshop itself. So worth a look at that, head to the IES website to find out more. So that's a very quick introduction um, and probably enough from us from, for now. As mentioned, uh, we have three CM registrants with us today to talk about how CM has helped them personally and within their careers. Each speaker is from a different type of organisation and they have held their CM registration for differing amounts of time, um, between five years and 15 years actually, uh, which we hope will provide some differing perspectives. Um, but also some key similarities, uh, no matter what background they're from, possibly. But we shall see. Uh, firstly, each of our guests have a few minutes each to introduce who they are, um, why they do what they do, and, and how CM fits into that picture. Uh, so first up, uh, to provide her insight, is Philippa Pearson, who's uh, appeared on your screen now. Uh, she is the Head of Water Services Science at um, Welsh Water. I'm not going to try and pronounce the, uh, the Welsh version, but I'll leave that to Philippa. Um, and is registered as a Chartered Environmentalist via the Institute of Water. Philippa, can you hear us? Yes, I can, Phil. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so I thought I'd start with a bit of an introduction to me and, and my career. Um, so as, as Phil said, I became a Chartered Environmentalist back in, in 2011 uh, through the Institute of Water. Um, I guess it's probably a little bit cliche to say this, but it was a really proud moment for me. I've got a real fascination about the environment. It's a, a long held fascination and a particular interest in water as well. That I've had from a really young age. I can't 
I can't really remember quite where it came from or explain to you why, but it's always been there. And I think, you know, it's, it's very much came through my education. So I did a degree and a PhD in geography, um, which was a subject I very much decided to specialise in because of my interest in the environment. Uh, when I graduated back in, in 2003, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do career wise, um, but I knew I wanted to do something related to the environment. Um, I guess the water industry ticked a lot of my career boxes, uh, the links, obvious links to the environment, uh, job satisfaction as well, which I guess, if I'm really honest, I didn't really fully understand until I joined the industry, um, just how much goes in behind the scenes to ensure that people have a continuous and wholesome supply of drinking water. So this year, particularly in a global pandemic, how important that we that we provide um uh, particularly you know in making sure that we could have that continuous supply of water to key workers hospitals um care homes and you know our, our general customer base as, as we go through these difficult times um, so for the last 17 years that i've been in the water industry i've held a variety of roles um, from water production through to distribution um i spent a lot of time in catchment management which i'll come on and talk about a little bit in a minute um, my current role as Head of Water Services Science in De Cymru, Welsh Water. Uh, just getting that pronunciation in there for you, Phil. Um, and at the moment, I'm responsible for a team of 47 scientists. Um, we provide the advice and guidance to the water part of our business, right from source to tap. So lots of um, links into the environment from obviously the water that we abstract um, and to the water that we put back into the environment. Um, so it's great to be here with you today. I've um, been a chartered environmentalist for coming up to 10 years now. Um, and I think today's webinar has really given me an opportunity to reflect back on, on what the chartered environmentalist um, registration has really given me and help how it's helped me with my career and I think I can summarize it under three key headings really um, so first of all um, it's around the structure that's given to my career planning obviously there's a strong focus on CPD and, and setting goals uh, looking at how um, I develop my skills and also taking that time to reflect and reset and think about what I want to do in the future secondly it's around um, how I communicate and how I influence people, right from thinking about how I wanted to communicate in my application and my interview, what I've done in terms of my career and, and how my career is relevant to the environment. And thirdly, the opportunities that it's given me and continues to give me um, around uh, learning and you know ongoing networking and finding out more, not just about my industry, but about other industries as well. So I'm going to be really interested in hearing what the, the other speakers today uh, I've got to say around their experiences. So just to go into a little bit more detail in those three key points, um, firstly around career planning and developing my skills. As I said, obviously CPD is, is really critical. Not It's not just about achieving the registration in the, in the first instance, but it's how do you maintain your continuous um, development. It's about thinking about what skills do I need? What skills do I want? What what direction do I want my career to go in in the future? It's about prioritising and focusing. Um, some of that can be through you know, attending formal conferences. Some of it can be events and discussions, even, even down to events like today where, you know, just asking even the question and answer session hearing different perspectives um different opinions and different views and 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 really developing new ideas and, and different thoughts um thinking ahead has been a really crit critical part of my career um i've been very heavily involved in strategy work within welsh water and obviously thinking around uh, my own career and setting goals and, and my own development has been it's been a skill that i can really um transfer it into my into my role as well Secondly, around uh, communication and influencing skills. Um, as I said, right through from application through to interview, thinking about how do I communicate what it is that I do, um, my skills and experience, but also how do I influence people to, to understand that. And I think you know, that's, that's been really key for me in terms of a transferable skill in, in my career. 
uh, when I joined the water industry back in, in 2003, there was a real strong focus on uh, pouring concrete and building our way out of, of challenges. During my time in the industry, there's been a real shift in the change of thinking and in, in, in our approach and um, a real strong recognition of the environment and how um, things do change and some of the threats and challenges that we face from the environment. And I think we've had a real strong reminder of that in the industry over the last couple of years with with um, Storm Emma, the beast from the east back in 2018, uh, Storm Callum in 2019. And even though it's hard to, to believe after everything that's happened this year with uh, COVID, Storm Callum back in 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 the start of uh, start this year in February, which um, many of you may have seen on the news had quite a significant effect in terms of flooding in Wales, including one of our water treatment works, which was flooded uh, in Monmouth and was featured on, on quite a few of the news channels. So you'll understand some of the challenges we, we faced around that. Um, and a large part of my career has been spent developing Welsh Water's catchment management approach. Um, you know, it's very easy when I, I talk about the, the journey we've gone on as, as a business around catchment management to make it sound very um, simple. But uh, there's been a lot of uh, work that's gone on uh, in the background um, to really develop and um, uh, understand the potential that catchment management can deliver for the business. And it's been challenging at times to really be able to convince the business where, you know, we, we operate in a very um, heavily regulated industry. We can be very risk averse. There are a lot of variables that affect catchment management and, and some less un, uh, some more uncertainties around taking that approach. So, you know, being able to communicate and influence it has been a really important skill in, in getting the business to buy into that and developing our approach and taking it forward. And then thirdly, to move on to the opportunities it, it's given me. And, and I mean, this comes in so many different forms, um, you know, from CPD activities to attending events and, and networking. But one of the things that I've taken a really strong interest in is learning from others particularly in terms of catchment management this isn't something that is just unique to Welsh water or unique to the UK it's something that we do around the world making sure that we uh, protect our drinking water sources that we influence land management uh, that influences uh, water quality and that we try and abstract the best possible water quality that that we can um, so I've looked around the world at um, opportunities uh, to learn from others and uh, last year I went across to New York and I went to visit the Catskills area a um, couple of hundred miles outside of, of New York City which is the the area which most of New York's water supply comes from and I had the chance to, to meet people who've been involved in their catchment management program for over 30 years and get to visit some locations that you would never get an opportunity to go and visit unless it, it, it was through your career. Um, again networking and meeting like-minded people uh, from lots of different industries and, and lots of different sectors is really important it's great to be here today and I guess one of the things that I can't fail to mention in in my in my sort of opening introduction really is around um, one of my career highlights which was being named as uh, the Society for the Environment's Environmental Professional of the Year back in in 2017. Um, my career has never been about um, winning awards um, you know it's always been about doing the right thing and pushing the boundaries and um, seeing how how far we can take something and seeing what opportunities we can uncover and and really challenging ourselves on that but um obviously to be recognized for the contribution that I've made and, and the success that I've had in my career is just you know a huge huge honor um so for that that for me really covers the main ways in which I think being a chartered environmentalist has, has helped me and helped my career. Um, I feel really privileged to have had the career that I've had and, and still have and hopefully will have for, for many years to come because for me it, it, my career isn't just a job it's I guess a bit of a vocation. Um, sometimes it feels like um, it's, it's not really work at all and I think you know if you if you can do a day's work and it and it feels like fun then you, you're definitely in, in the right place and I guess you know just to, to finish I feel really proud of being a chartered environmentalist and um, and of the opportunities that I have so uh, yeah so that's me thanks okay thank you very much Philippa that was fantastic um, having fun making a difference and being able to go to New York not bad at all. Um, now, next up, we have uh, Becky Toll. 
Uh, Becky is the director at uh, Crowberry Consulting, and, and Becky is registered as a chartered environmentalist via IEMA. Um, and I'll leave the rest of the introduction to Becky. Becky, are you with us? I, I am, Phil. I do have some slides. I don't know if you Excellent. want to drive them. Or... Yes, yes. If you just let me know when you want to progress the slides, I'll... Uh... Uh, yeah. So, hi, everyone who's on the webinar or listening back to this. My name is Becky Toll, owner, manager, founder of Crowberry Consulting Limited. Um, and if you just stop on that slide there, Phil, for us. Um, so, I started my sort of environmental journey back in 1992, um, where I, when I enrolled to do a Bachelor of Science in Ecology. Um, graduated there in 1995 and that's where I heard of this wonderful organisation called the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment or IEMA um, and it was round about then 1995 1996 that I joined IEMA um, so currently I have over 20 years business to business experience internationally of providing training audits consultancy and I run a growing team here in Chorley where I've dressed up in my Christmas gear because I said to Phil we would have to make this more of a festive webinar and um, so we focus mainly on sustainability delivery through ISO systems bespoke consultancy training both online and face-to-face -face and auditing helping clients with their sustainability strategies um, through the UN sustainable development goals net carbon zero um, if you can move on to the next slide Phil um, so yeah, so established in 2006, I'll come on to how I got to be able uh, to, to go from 1995 to 2006. Um, but we do specialise in energy, environment, ethics, event management um, with ethical auditing as well. Uh, next slide. For uh, just a bit of the, the, the summary there, what we do, what we specialise in. If you can move on, Phil. Uh, we are a values-based business. Um, we focus on integrity, intelligence and inspiration, delivering that to our clients since 2006. Thanks, Phil. Um, so my journey, just in case there's anybody out there who, who's thinking, oh, interesting, someone who set up their own business. Um, like I said, I graduated in 1995 um, with my first degree and then I joined IEMA as a, I think I joined originally as a student member. Um, so I would encourage you all to, to consider doing that if that's something that appeals to you. Then I followed that degree with a master's in environmental impact assessment. And then I did a wonderful MBA in environmental management at the University of Liverpool, which really unlocked all the doors for me uh, personally and professionally. I moved from there to work with English Nature, which has now changed its name to Natural England. And I was their first environmental manager. Um, and I'll talk about my career highlights uh, with them shortly. I moved then into the cooperative world, cooperative bank as an environmental analyst, and then the cooperative group where I headed up their environmental um, program. Uh, they'd never had an environmental program before um, I joined, so it was quite an interesting uh, opportunity to implement environmental strategy, environmental policy, and convince people that climate change was real and that you know biodiversity was suffering um, back in the early 2000s. Thousands. I might as well have been talking Russian um, because people didn't believe a word we were saying, but it's got a lot easier now, thank goodness. Um, so from my journey between 1992 to 2005, that's where I really kind of got a lot of my industry experience. I retained, obviously, my, my EMA membership through CPD. And in 2005, I did, I think, the, the interview that uh, Philippa mentioned there, the application to Society for the Environment and achieved my... Um, chartered environmentalist status and it was celebrated as well because clearly again not many people knew what being a chartered environmentalist was and I do remember the managers at the co-op um, we had a, a nice sort of celebratory lunch when, when I achieved that and then in 2006 I set up my own business which is called Crowbury Consulting Limited and then in 2010 I established Crowbury Energy um, so both those um, are still trading today next slide Phil uh, so some of the highlights for me and how being a, a SOC end has, has helped. Um, obviously, when I was at the co-op, co-writing co the CSR report, creating their sustainability onboarding process for suppliers, implementing ISO 14001 across all the different business divisions. Um, I think it's about eight different businesses at the time. And then subsequent to that, 
um, using the Society for the Environment Chartered Environmentalist Status to enable me to grow my business and obviously to recruit um, people to the team, working with a very diverse client range from football clubs to food sites to um, you know hotels, um, as you can see there. Currently working with uh, HM government, and I've been very lucky or unlucky, if you want to call it that, to travel quite a fair bit um, over to Bangkok and Thailand, Dubai, most of Europe. Um, we have clients pretty much all over the place, and I audited the first stadium in the world uh, to achieve ISO 2012 one. So that was a definite highlight. I was a speaker at Forum Istanbul in 2010. Um, in 2017, we achieved top 100 employer of the year for apprenticeships. And this year, I'm very, very proud of um, what we've achieved with, with Phil, uh, which is just here behind my head, which is the Chartered um, Environmentalist Employer champion um, so we actively encourage um, our staff to work towards professional um, CPD and professional accreditations and I think throughout all of this journey sort of my sort of 20 25 years working in environmental management and sustainability it, um, having chartered status becomes a door opener um, and, I, and I would encourage all of you on the webinar who are thinking about doing the one day workshop that Phil mentioned to, to please go for that um, and to work towards uh, achieving your chartered uh, status. It certainly helps when it comes to looking at CVs that land on my desk regularly um, to get you onto the let's interview this person pile as opposed to the I'm not going to interview them in a million years pile. Um, next slide please. Phil. Yeah, so that's me. Thank you for your time today. Um, and if anyone's got any specific questions, happy to happy to answer them. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that's uh, that's quite a journey, uh, but very extremely useful to to have an insight on. Um, I am intrigued to know if you wore the Santa hat uh, in your client meeting that you had just before this webinar. No, I've done this specifically for you, Phil. So oh, thank you very much. We very <laughs> much appreciate it. As well, I thought we'd make it a bit more, a bit more Christmassy. <laughs> Quite right. And if anybody's watching this on the recording in June, we apologise, um, but it is Christmas at the moment. Um, also, whilst to think about it, I didn't mention it after Philippa's uh, talk, but if you experienced any connection problems, then uh, apologies. Uh, hopefully, it was understandable. Um, but if you have any questions or if you missed anything, just let us know and we should be able to uh, answer any of those questions. Um, right. Okay, so uh, our final speaker for today is uh, Zabrina Hanley, who is the Group Environmental Manager at First Group PLC and is also uh, registered as a CM via IEMA, uh, similarly to Becky. Um, so, Zabrina, it looks like you can hear us. So, I'll Yeah, can you hear me okay? I can indeed, yes. I'll, right. I'll hand awesome. over to you. Well, um, they've stuck me last after Becky and Philippa, um, who... There's, 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 there's no real career there, um, very formidable candidates that I, I can't beat uh, in terms of experience and history. And so I think the way that I want to go about the next five minutes is to add on mostly to what they've already said. Becky and Philippa have, have said some amazing points and I wholeheartedly agree with all of them. So here are a few extras that they haven't mentioned and a slightly different perspective on things just to, 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 to change it up, I guess. Um, so who am I? Uh, less a little bit about career and more as a person. Similar to Philippa, I've been a bit of a, a nature nerd from day one, a uh, product of quite a hippie family, in fact. And uh, it's just kind of been a way of life for me, a very value um, and sort of central part of my life to consider my impact on the environment and to be outdoors and mostly just go on a huge adventure you know the youthful optimism of just wanting a job where you can travel the world and see some penguins and it really shaped who I was so I, I went also to do physical geography at the University of Sheffield started that over 15 years now and that's gone so fast uh, and, and to be honest I was in my last year looking through all these jobs trying to figure out what I wanted to do next and everything just looked so 
corporate and so boring and just not at all what I wanted to do so honestly I went traveling I did quite a lot of conservation work so I was a scuba diver and we did uh, lots out there in sort of Mexico in, in the marine oceans I got some work doing uh, water quality testing during the floods in Australia with the Red Cross uh, I also did some turtle turtle conservation work also in Central America and and, and ran some recycling programs for youth summer camps in the US got out there and, and really did some amazing stuff. Um, and then I guess we reached the stage of my life, which I like to call grassroots realism, where I do have to go home and I probably need a job that's going to support me and develop me in some way. And I was really ready for it by then. Uh, the first job that I got was a uh, environment project manager at a company called ACE. Uh, they deal in the water industry, much like Philippa. So they used to uh, design products to... Um, sort of help canals and waterways and it was all really about getting the water out as quickly and, and as Philippa explained they completely changed the legislation and the, and the way that floodplains work looking at water management as a rewilding exercise a re-nature and they hired me for two reasons one they were really scared that their entire product portfolio was going to be made redundant because it was it was you know products that weren't allowed anymore or weren't seen as the future and two they were really keen on increasing their environmental credentials doing ISO 14001 uh, and I was just completely new super lucky to have the job and it was an amazing experience because I think any of you that have done a couple of years of environmental management it sometimes seems as as a, a an important and interesting part of the business but not not necessarily at the level where it's central to business activity and for me this business was really central so we were redesigning and looking at the products and seeing how else they could be used could we turn this pump in reverse to actually now this wind pump wets a wetland to keep it wet to keep it a conservation area rather than draining it can we add fish passes and uh, navigation channels um, around some of the, the blockades that we've put in the rivers for flood defense systems to allow nature to continue and it really helped the business thrive and that's when you see it I was just hooked I knew that this is what I wanted to do forever but we were in a small company in a small town I wanted London I wanted big big bigger projects I was I was getting the ambition and I was ready to go um, and, and that's when I really moved on to construction, uh, primarily for the water industry. So again, working with similar clients, but moving more on to larger projects. So helping build waste treatment sites as the contractor for the client. So you know, if, if Thames Water wanted something built on Anglian water and also to do the emergency repairs. So there's a, a lot that can go on there in terms of pollution, noise. Sometimes if a main bursts, we've got teams out there at 2 a.m. and managing that side of things can be hard. And it was just amazing experience. And I just kept growing, really. I changed to another company and ended up with a whole team doing large sections of Crossrail, doing bids for High Speed 2, um, working with some quite high profile clients when I had what I like to call the epiphany. <laughs> um, and, and for me, it was just sitting there realising that my entire objective, my personal objective is to make as big a difference as I can in these next 15, 20 years, because this is the this is the do or die time. This is where we've got to make it or break it. And I just felt where I was in terms of my career path. And if I kept progressing in that career path, I'd never get right to the top. And, and the power for me was where the money was, where the client was sitting, whoever had the money was the one calling the shots at an early enough stage to really make that change. And so I spent a good year on my personal development and I'll talk a lot about how SOCM and my CM status came into that um, in, in the second bit and, and then got this job really luckily at First Group which is which is basically a client of the kind of clients that I was working for on the construction side and um, there I've been a lot more of a generalist which is ideal for me I like to do lots of different things I don't like to get into technical silos routine can easily bore me if I'm honest so it's nice to have a real broad range of things to do to challenge myself to do sustainability strategies where we go way beyond climate it's a huge focus um, but to, to go way beyond to also take my corporate knowledge not just in the UK um, but completely internationally to places like India and Canada America uh, has been amazing and also really to just look at that strategic, how do we get to net zero? Um, so, let, so that's my career history. That's where I am now. Um, I'm also very much 
trying to grow as a person for myself. So, you know, it, today actually is a, is a really important learning challenge for me. I don't often do these kind of things, explain to people where, where I'm at or where I do. I, I naturally feel a bit uncomfortable with it. So I'm putting myself out there today, developing myself with SOCM uh, to do that. So for me, I think the three things that stand out, just like Philip has said, structure and leading development, CM has been amazing for that. Um, for me, I've often reported to someone who wasn't technical, so they weren't an environment professional, they weren't a sustainability professional. So how do I explain to them what do I need to do next and how do I know what I need to do next when I'm not being supported by you know a technical peer and the skills mapping and uh, you know seeing seeing how you progress has been instrumental in my one-to-ones I'd take it in there and be like this is where I think I am this is what I need to do this, these are the types of courses or experience that they recommend to get there and to have really constructive conversations about my development when you're talking to someone that doesn't know your job has been fundamental to me getting where I am today uh, it's, it's also really provided me with feedback when I've actually taken the, uh, so when, you, when I actually did my CM, you, you have an interview and the feedback from those interviews was invaluable. It's probably the first time in four or five years I'd had two real peers in, interrogate me in a way, um, but in a good way, actually point out where my strengths are, what I'm doing amazingly, and where I could go next. Um, finally, I think what I want to, to, to get across to people is why, why SOCEN as well? You know, you've got, you've got, you, you could be with the Royal Institute of Civil Engineers, with SIREM, with me and Becky and Aima, but then why would you want this CM as well when they've got their own membership levels? And for me, it's really about bringing us all together. Uh, environment is so broad and you can start in so many different areas, you know, and having 24 licensed bodies from, from everything from engineering to ecology just shows how broad our subject is but when you get to senior management level or when you're heading in that direction a lot of the soft skills and a lot of the technical skills become more broad in general and I think that that CM status really brings us together as not just a technical expert in one area but starting actually now to just lead the change for environment lead the change for climate and, and for sustainability and it sets a different precedent I think you know sometimes employers can be very confused when they see lots of different environmental uh, options out there and to just see a CM sometimes really just unifies where we're at and where we're heading and I think that that is a very powerful tool. Um, the third thing is it allows me to challenge internal pressure uh, and to go to go against or beyond my skills. I have been in uncomfortable positions before where people um, within my within my business or industry were maybe trying to get me to do more than I'm actually trained or capable to do. And also sometimes to uh, agree to things or to, to have a professional judgment that isn't necessarily what I believe. And so having that code of conduct that we sign and having that kind of pathway to demonstrating how you can be an independent third party, even though you're sat in your business, has been really powerful for me as well. It feels like a safe place that you can show show people that this is how, as a professional, you you have to work and you have to behave. And so, yeah, that's my career history. Uh, it's where I am now, and and how CM has really helped me to get there. I hope that's helpful to some of you in some way. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that, Sabrina. Really interesting indeed. Um, and if I could invite all of our speakers today to uh, turn their webcams on, and we're going to go into a bit of a, a question and answer session straight into it. Um, but one mention on Sabrina's, I, I love the, uh, the, the, the epiphany moment. Excellent <laughs> stuff. Really good insight there. Um, so as mentioned, Q&A time, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Sarah, who's joining me today, and uh, Sarah's going to run the Q&A for us. Thank you, Phil. Um, and also a big thanks again to all our speakers. So, hi guys. <laughs> um, and thank you for your great insights and uh, general enthusiasm as well. Great to see the festive spirit as well. So, thank you. <laughs> and um, as Phil said, uh, now's the time for the Q&A. Um, if you haven't already, um, just a reminder that you can ask questions via the Q&A function on your toolbars. So, make sure to do that. Um, I'll make sure to get through as many questions as I can before the 6 p.m. close. So um, here goes. So uh, we did have a few questions submitted at registration. So I'll just start with one of those. So this is a question, I think, for all of you, really. Um, 
It's about mentoring. Did you have a mentor to help you with gaining CM registration? And do you actually have a mentor now as well? So uh, who, who'd like to start with that one? Should we start with um, Becky? Yeah. Um, very straightforward. No, I did not have a mentor. Um, but I am currently a mentor for quite a few mentees. I don't charge any money for it. I do it voluntarily. I th- I feel it's important to give back. I'm currently studying a level five in coaching and mentoring at Edge Hill University um, because unfortunately, yeah, there's, there's not enough uh, professional coaching and mentoring being offered to younger people who start out in sustainability and environmental management. If there's anybody on this call that needs a mentor, let me know, but don't all rush at once because I've got two at the moment. <laughs> um, but back in 2005, like I said, I might as well have been speaking Russian to people talking about climate change and species extinction and, you know, single use plastics. Um, it's changed a lot now, thank God. But yeah, if you can get hold of a mentor, brilliant. Um, and there are some free platforms out there, especially for women in STEM to get a mentor. So um, that's that's my experience of it. But it's, it is super helpful, Sarah. So I don't know if Sabrina and um, Philippa have experienced that. Yes, I'm um, happy to go next, Sarah. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, in terms of mentoring, yeah, I think mentoring is really, really important. Um, in terms of my chartered environmentalist journey, I didn't have a mentor specifically for that, but throughout my career, um, I've had a number of mentors and I've also mentored people. I think mentoring is, is very important, whether you're the mentor or the mentee. In 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 any case, you, you learn in both roles. And I think reverse mentoring is, is really important going forward as well, so that you do learn from other people, early career people, uh, particularly as new generations come through. Uh, one of the things I'm not so, so great on is uh, IT skills. So I do uh, really appreciate... Um, some of my colleagues and a new generation coming through are much better on IT skills and data analytics and that side of things. Um, In Welsh Water, we've got a lot of focus on on mentoring. We do have official mentoring. We also do unofficial mentoring as well. So I can't recommend it enough. And I think it's also important to find the right mentor and not be afraid to say if if your mentor relationship isn't quite working for you, then that's quite okay. And, And mentors, a good mentor will accept that 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 is the case so yeah i can't recommend it highly enough really thank you and sabrina i yeah uh, again agree with everything becky and philippa said i for my cm i didn't have a direct mentor but there were opportunities within my institution to attend networking events so it was if you if you wanted to be a chartered environmentalist, come to this networking event and they would bring a number of people who were assess- assessors or had been at that level for a while. It also was a sneaky help for me that I was doing a maternity cover at IEMA um, around the time just for the year. So I kind of felt like I had about 15 mentors around me. Um, and yeah, it was it was quite hard uh, because I think people were really, really keen to grill me even harder just to make sure that they could tick all of those conflict of interest boxes. So it was a very different experience. But I would say to get to that point, I'd already had a lot of mentoring. As I said, uh, there's a lot of people now who find themselves, especially in-house, as maybe the only person. And it is so important to reach out to your peers people from different backgrounds and different industries that have different insight, even to just collaborate rather than mentoring, I found really helpful. Um, At the moment, I'm also part of a mentoring group for future chief sustainability officers. And I have a chief sustainability officer from a private equity firm mentoring me. Um, If you want to go down mentoring, I'd say just be really, have have a really good think to yourself and be able to write down, what is my goal? What am I trying to achieve? And, and how can somebody help me? What kind of skills would that person have that could help me? And once you've got that written down, you can really go out there on LinkedIn or to a networking event and really find that person. I think it's really good to set in your head first what you want to get out of it before you, you, you go out there. But yeah, mentoring's great. Thank you. Uh, that was all. That was great. Thank you, everyone. Um, just moving on to a question about CPD, we've got a question here. How did you, and how do you find time to keep on top of CPD? And how do you identify what to include and what not to include? Um, they said here, uh, for someone like them who's been working in the industry for 
four years plus and doesn't know where best, best to start. So who wants to go first on that one? Should we go to um, Debbie? I don't mind. I mean, I can only talk from really IEMA um, because they have the online portal. So you just log in with your username and password and it's quite um, obvious where you put which type of CPD, whether you've gone to a networking event or, you know, you've got some official training um, or you've presented on a webinar or something like that. So it's quite kind of clear or if you if you do audits, like where you're the lead auditor or the auditor, you know, so it's, it kind of helps you structure how to populate your CPD. And I tend to leave it till once a year and I get the diary out and I just kind of blitz it um, and fill it all in in one go. Um, the, the level that I'm at, it's kind of like I'm trying to encourage other people's careers and help other people with their career progression. So when you get to kind of director level, it's a different kind of ball game really. But if you're at sort of practitioner level, um, you know, you'd obviously, you can't put your clients' names in because you've got GDPR and all this stuff. But you know, you can do stuff anonymously and, you know, sort of clock up the CPD points if you like. But I'm sure, you know, that lovely slide that Phil put up before with all the different logos of the memberships for, for SOC Env, you know, wow, each one of those probably has a different portal, I would guess. Um, Sarah, Sabrina and Philippa, I, I don't know. Uh, be maybe interesting to hear because I guess, Sabrina, you use the same IEMA portal as me, but you know, just kind of capture everything um, because you always learn something from, from every experience and it's all potentially mm. good uh, continued professional development. So that, that would be my tip, kind of keep a diary, keep a log. And then once, once every six months, once a year, just, just sit down and blitz it. Yeah. No, that's uh, it's such good advice. I mean, from my perspective, how, how do I find the time is uh, I think people think that CPD, continued professional development, needs to be this massively distinct thing from your day-to-day -day job. So I am not a natural academic. I'm not. I love working on the job. I like learning things that are important for me to achieve my goals on the job that year. Um, I toyed with the idea of going back and doing a part-time master's for a very long time. And I think I've settled on the fact that I am just too scatterbrained and like to just do a bit of everything to really be that person and I think that's so important figure out who you are what kind of learning really engages you and makes you passionate because to spend any time on yourself you've really got to be switched on and wanting to do it uh, secondly you know a lot of stuff that you're probably doing every day does count as professional development and I think it's really worthwhile going back to your institute and checking the breadth of what it includes so, for example, I sit on some advisory boards with the rail industry. So all the rail counterparts come together. We have an environmental forum. That counts. That's us collaborating. That is us sharing best practice uh, and anything like that. And when you really break that down, time doing audits on site, that is professional development. You are getting out there and you are redoing a skill that you need to keep up to date. And so when you start adding all those bits together, um, I, would, I would also really say it's worth going back to your bosses and making sure that they understand and you manage their expectations that if you are going to be a chartered environmentalist, you have to maintain a certain number of hours and that they need to help you to achieve that. And I think that's really important to set a precedent that and, and sometimes in, in some of the larger consulting firms, and I know this has got a lot better from talking to colleagues over the last five to ten years, but they can they can be quite focused on time management and billing your time and, and not necessarily give you the attention you need to sit and keep that learning up to date but I think again that's it that's how CM and, and your, your professional membership can really champion you getting your head down and keeping up to date with knowledge um, so yeah that would be my addition to Becky's point. Yeah I agree with a lot of uh, what Sabrina has said there so you know personal development should be very personal it should be about what works for you um, and I think there, there's lots of uh, templates and structures out there. Institute of Water's got an online portal in which you can record it. That That's not what works for me. I have my own log. I've developed it um, to be something that, that works for me and my development. Um, similar to Becky, I do review my CPD on an annual basis, but I also, I have a reoccurring calendar invite to remind me every Friday to sit back and reflect on what I've done in the week, what I've done well. It's always good to give you a pat on the back for something that you've done well
well and then think about if you were to go back what you do differently next time round. so I try in my CPD as well as logging you know events that I attend and some of the technical things I do is also about my own personal development uh, what I, I'm one of these people who I've been it's very easy for me to focus on negative so I always give myself credit for something that I've done well and then I'll think about something about what I want to do differently going forward or a learning point so yeah I guess um, you know a lot of what Becky and Sabrina have said is very relevant to me it's it, CPD is about being very personal how you record it as long as it's got those key elements of setting goals recording the professional development that you've done and taking that time to review and reset I don't think it matters is how it's structured. Thank you all. Um, there's some really great advice there, I think. So great. Um, just another question here in terms of um, CM registration and professional body membership in the environmental sector um, is kind of at the moment perhaps more of a nice to have um, and that we want to move towards where it's more of an essential. Um, what do you think needs to happen for us to get to that next stage? Um, Becky? I think it's already happening. I did say to Phil before coming on this today that post-COVID there's going to be an explosion of um, sustainability and environmental management interest and there's going to be an awful lot more greenwashing, um, if you know what that phrase is, and there's going to be an awful lot more people that will claim to be sustainability managers and will claim to have, you know, environmental management knowledge and environmental skills, whereas everyone who's listening to this webinar knows, well, if you claim it, you've got to be able to prove it, yeah? So that's where Society for the Environment and all our lovely um, professional institutes come in, isn't it? So directly links to that previous question about CPD logs and being able to demonstrate that you've got a big word, competency. Um, and I can't stress that enough. I did answer on the chat. If you're considering joining a professional institution, just don't think twice, just do it. It's worth its weight in gold. Um, take fill up on that opportunity to have the day workshop to become a chartered environmentalist because it's about separating the wheat from the chaff. You know, if you're in a room and you're talking to lots of people networking and they see a business card that you've got CN on there, they're going to ask you, you know, and back in 2005, people assumed I was a chartered engineer um, because they mislooked at what CN was. And I was constantly explaining, you know, this is chartered environmentalist, you know, society for the environment. You know, I was literally flying the flag for society for the environment. Um, but then now, fast forward 15 years, amazing. People know what it is. They value it. They respect it. But it does link to competency and I think we're going to have a big issue in the next 10 years around people jumping on the bandwagon cl claiming to be sustainability managers when they're not and they've got no professional um, credentials to back that up. So strong shout out from me, Sarah, uh, Sabrina and, and Philippa and, and Phil, you know, to kind of really go for um, your SOC and uh, chartered status. Thank you. Yeah. So I've got a team of uh, 47 scientists and, you know, we, we've got lots of different types of scientists within the team. Um, so within our, within our job descriptions, we actually require um, everybody in the team to be, to either have a professional membership or be working towards it. Um, I, it doesn't matter to me what membership it is because I've got lots of different types of scientists in the team so I've got chartered scientists I've got chartered chemists I've got chartered geographers chartered environmentalists as long as we're working towards something because I think it's not just about um as a business having people that are competent but it, as individuals you know we have to take responsibility for our own careers our own development if we want to to get on if we want to progress you know we have the power to make that happen and I think that uh, professional membership really sets the structure and sets the scene for that to happen and for individuals to take their own responsibility so I actively encourage all of my team to do it because it's good for me as as the manager and as the head of the team but it's also good for the individuals to get them into that practice yeah and I very quick point I again Becky and Philippa speak the truth and I wholeheartedly agree um I, I would I would say in, in terms of what I think, you know, there was a part of the question on, on, on what else could we do? And I guess my experience in the last couple of years is, you know, my ultimate ambition, it might take 
10 years might take 20 years to be a chief sustainability officer and tantamount to becky's point that's where we as environmental sustainability professionals are starting to lose out our ceiling kind of caps out at very senior management level and then they seem to be giving a lot of those chief sustainability positions to people who had more board and management finance experience and then oh that they'll learn sustainability it will be fine i think the latest statistics came out 17 percent of the 5500 had uh, board members or executive members that had credentials in sustainability when they'd been appointed the sustainability or climate lead and so i think actually as an industry socem most of um, the, the membership bodies that represent environment and sustainability professionals really have to work on that level now. So not just with fellowship, but how do we get these people into the boards to negate the change to make the future we need? And, and for me, that's something we could all work together to, to do much more of um, over, over, over the next few years. If I could just put in, um, it's. I think uh, Zabrina is absolutely right. Um, there should be more uh, environmental and sustainability professionals on boards um as directors uh, and so on and it's absolutely something we're looking into um it is a challenge uh, as you rightly say um but it's something that probably should be happening so something we're working on um but i'll hand back to sarah well, that's great thanks phil um just moving on to another question about um philippa mentioned that her biggest career achievement was probably winning the environmental professional of the year award um <laughs> Becky and Sabrina, do you have um, a particular achievement that, you, that would you say is that be your sort of greatest achievement? I think, thank you. If it's all right, Sabrina, I'll just chip in quickly. Probably the biggest thing is setting up a business from scratch, from zero, growing it, getting through two recessions and the global pandemic and still being here. Um, you know, that's just down to my belligerence and, you know, sheer resilience of wanting to provide good quality services to our clients um, and my passion for sustainability you know you've got to remember when I started people thought I was nuts doing an ecology degree um, they thought I was nuts going off to do a master's in environmental impact assessment most people never even heard of that um, so you know but we've come through all that now and we're normalizing a mainstream in sustainability which is amazing and big shout out to my um, alumni University of Sheffield, which is the only university in the UK to mandatory on all of their degrees offer a module on sustainability. And that's where we need to be. All the apprenticeships, all the Kickstarters, all the traineeships need to learn about sustainability. So I think that's my, my personal big thing is setting up a business and, and running with it and making it a success. So over to Sabrina. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would say... I see. I see. Just I'm. I'm a bit. I'm a bit more like airy fairy. So I see achievement in a completely different way. Um, and for me, I, I like. I like to wake up every day and just remind myself what I'm really grateful for. And to have a job that isn't just me getting up and making some money to go home and, and live the life that I want. That it is absolutely central to who I am as a person. It fits my very nature and it inspires me every single day, even when I've had a crap week, when people have been closing those doors, when I feel like I'm getting nowhere, that gets me back up to try again. You know, it, that, that, is, that is a continuous achievement that will keep on giving. And, and, and that's what I really say to people. You've got, you've got to follow your heart a little, a little bit more than perhaps people tell us to, especially our parents. It was the same same with Becky, like I said I was going to do geography at uni and they just gave me this blank look like I was insane and they weren't, they weren't going to support it. But here, here, here we are and, and, it, and it's worked out. So, yeah, I, I think my greatest achievement really is that kind of sticking to my guns right at the beginning, deciding what I loved and that that was more important than, than what I earned. And actually, in the end, that's worked out really nicely. I'm in a senior position. I can see a pathway to more senior roles. Uh, and the ambition is there, but it's not on something that feels a bit soulless. Um, and that for me is just, that's daily gratitude and you can't beat that. So that's a great achievement. Thanks both. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm finding this very inspiring. <laughs> so it's great. Um, just uh, maybe the last question. Um, so with the focus on environmental challenges becoming stronger and stronger as we've We've talked about today and um, how do you think the cf registration will help you in the coming years 
Um, Philippa, do you want to go first with that one? Yeah, I'll go first. Yeah, I think for me, it's all about my mindset. Um, you know, it's about uh, what I take, what I learn, what I apply in the broader context. Um, so my background is very environmental, but what I work in now is is much much broader. And it's the the approach that I take and the mindset that I take. Um, I take a much longer term mindset to, to management and to risk. Um, I when I think about um, strategy, I tend to be quite strategic. I'll think in that longer term. And I think for me, in terms of in terms of my business and the impact that I can make on it that having that thinking and that mindset is, is critical, really. I, I'm happy to go next if, if, that, if that works. OK, so uh, how can how can my CM help me to get further? And you know what? To not necessarily have a great answer to that is, is very fine. I, I think that's actually what I've been doing over the last two or three months. You know, I've got my CM, so that's never going to go away and to remove it. Will, will always will always be a step backwards but where's my step forwards now so with my current institution IEMA I could look at fellowship and that's certainly something I'm considering and then as Phil's already explained they're looking at maybe that board level but that's really the, the, the whole point of us all coming together that's where the industry's got to go next it's right we're CM we're senior managers we're, we're making the impact we need to make but now now the traction has grown. We have an international Paris Agreement. We have hard-hitting targets in the UK now to, to net zero. It impacts every single business. It impacts every single person's life. And people like us need to be going further up the chain to, to negate, negate that. And I think that's where we all need to go next. And that is, that is the journey. And I'm, I'm actually one of those people that's thinking, how can I make that happen? Rather than sitting here waiting for someone to come up with a solution. Um, so, you know, that that's kind of my goal for, for next year to really go out there and start working with, you know, non-executive and director level membership boards, connect that with the environment, with some of the, the, the groups uh, that I'm working with, some of the graduates and apprentices and, and how can we get there. So, yeah, you know, that, that sometimes if you see that you, you feel like you've hit the top, it's not up to someone else to say, oh, this is where you can go next and, and we'll get you there. Sometimes you've got to say to yourself, right, I've got to make this happen for myself. And actually that's where we're at now. We, we need to go further up and we all need to make that happen for ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, happy to go last. I mean, obviously this is what I'm most proud of this year, achieving our employer status uh, with SOC N. So encouraging people to come into the company and develop their professional um you know, CPD and their in technical institute and accreditations, but to show the world that, you know, we were working with Society for the Environment as an employer champion, because we use that on our tenders, we use that on our website, we use that, you know, when we're talking to people on our email footers and to promote, 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 um, because we want people to join this industry. We want people to come into our world about environmental management and sustainability. It's a fantastic place to be, uh, despite all the challenges that we have and, you know, all, all the conversations, are, you know, nudging that we have to do with people. Um, it is a great place. To, it's a great place to work in sustainability. Um, but as I said before, competency matters, having professional certifications matters. Um, because, you know, it's so technical what we do on a day to day basis. And I think, you know, both Sabrina and Philippa, you know, said it right there. You know, there are people in mid management roles who get promoted into these sort of sustainability managers roles who will struggle without a bit of help and without a bit of support, whether that's coaching, mentoring or, you know, working through IEMA or Energy Institute or the many different institutes that there are under the Society for the Environment umbrella. So we're here to help them um, and to support them, because if we don't do that, we all suffer, you know. Thank you. Yeah, there's some great words to end on there. So um, I'll um, finish now and I'll hand back to Phil. And um, thank you all again. And um, yeah, I'll hand back to Phil for a, a final round roundup of um, some opportunities and resources um, that you can benefit from. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much um, to all three of you for your excellent answers. Lots of enthusiasm, um, which is really, really good to hear. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and, and all of your insight that you gave uh, in your initial talks as well. Um, like Sarah mentioned, I'm just going to go through a, a few opportunities now. So we're going to say goodbye to our speakers for now. Um, but thank you very much. And uh, here's a few opportunities for you. Um, 
in fact, very, very quickly, uh, there was a question on there as well about the CM Vina Day uh, uh, workshops that the Institution of Environmental Sciences run. That is, it's not a Society for the Environment thing. It, it, that is a, um, an IES uh, workshop. Now, whether you've mentioned IEMA, whether they do something very similar, that there is a good possibility that they might do. Uh, so have a chat with the IEMA membership team, um, and it may well, be, may well be the case with a lot of our other reg um, licensed members, if I can get my words out. Have a chat with them see what kind of opportunities are available to assist with your chartered environmentalist application. And there may well be things that will be really suitable for how you like to work and um, to get you, you moving on your registration application. Right. Now these opportunities, um, if you're interested to hear more about CM registration, um, please watch some of our uh, recorded webinars are on our website, the website address is on your screen now. And that includes uh, assessor top tips, um, how to register guides uh, and more inspiration if you still need it that is um, the recording of this webinar will join those recorded webinars very shortly um, it will be uh, possibly a couple of weeks time um, so those are watching live you've got this uh, in, in good time um, they're also available on our youtube channel uh, where you can subscribe to gain notifications of new webinars such as this As many of you will be looking into becoming chartered, hence why you're on this particular webinar, um, the last note from me is that the chartered environmentalist community have recently been telling the world about their vital work and why they do it, similar to what we've heard today. Um, and if you're aspiring to become a CM, um, this is a really good place for some really good insights and inspiration from across different sectors, across different disciplines and continents. So if you search for the hashtag I am CM on LinkedIn and YouTube in particular, also on Twitter as well, um, you'll find there's some really good insights on there, good video content, um, some interviews, uh, more webinars, uh, some wise words of advice. It's a really interesting place to look for a good diverse range of environmental professionals. And if you are a chartered environmentalist watching this, feel free to get involved. Um, this was run throughout August, but we're running it again in, in December and it's now December. So feel free to uh, send some details into us. Go to the website that's on your, on your screen now and it'd be great to share your story as well. And the final slide from me is a big thank you again uh, for listening and taking part and a huge thank you to Becky, Sabrina and Philippa for their excellent insights. Um, if you're watching this as a recording on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel, like the video, and if you hit the, um, the bell, you'll receive notifications of new content. So I'll stop talking there. Um, we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you very much for watching and please stay safe. <laughs>